Few athletes have shown more grit and strength both on and off the field than my guest tonight. After being selected 196th overall by the Denver Broncos, Terrell Lamar Davis would become the fourth player in NFL history to rush for 2,000 yards in a single season. He was a league MVP and is a two-time Super Bowl champion. But before being inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, did you know he suffered from severe migraines since childhood, quit playing football in high school, had his college football program dropped? Tonight, we'll learn what makes this undeniable icon who he is. A man who once said, you can be the best person in the league, but if you don't win championships, something's missing. Please welcome Terrell Davis. Thanks. Thanks. Nice, 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 nice. Salute you. I feel like if I handed you a football right now, you could probably go for 120 yards <laughs> on a given Sunday. I mean, you look, uh, you've no. kept yourself in unbelievable shape. I mean, you're a 45-year-old man, for God's sake. Yeah, yeah. Almost 45. Yeah, okay. Al almost, 44, almost 45. 44 and 5 eighths. Yes, I'm close to it. But, you know... I think part of it is once you've played the game, uh, the discipline and the, uh, the work habits, they don't stop, you know, at least not for me. And I think the one thing I try to do is I have three young kids now. And so I have my oldest two boys and I have my daughter who's youngest. And I think for me is to try to stay in shape so that one day they're gonna challenge me. <laughs> and I gotta make sure I'm ready for when they do challenge me. I, it makes all the sense in the world. Uh, born in October in 1972 in San Diego. So what was it like growing up in the, in the Davis household? My dad had been in the streets in St. Louis and, and my mom was sort of trying to remove us from that environment. So her grandfather was in San Diego and she moved out to San Diego, but she was pregnant with me when she moved. I have five older brothers. My memories of, of the early childhood were one where I was the youngest and uh, having to fight with my brothers a lot and trying to, you know, gain their respect that whether it was sports or at the dinner table because you couldn't sit back and just wait for it for seconds because there was no guarantee you were going to get seconds. Um, so just kind of going through those things. And I don't know, I always felt like I was the, uh, I was spoiled a little bit as being the youngest from my mom. My dad didn't like it a whole lot. Right. My dad wanted me to be to be tougher. Yeah, he thought you were, you know, you're the baby. Yes, I and, was the baby. But didn't want you to act like the baby right. of the family, right? That's, that's true. And I, I've always felt that my dad looked at me, my dad looked at me a little differently than he did my brothers. And growing up, you know, having that stigma of being mama's boy and uh, crying a lot, he, he didn't like that. And my mom would say, well, that's my baby. And my dad would always say, he ain't no damn baby. There's a special place in heaven for nurses, nurses' aides. That's what your mom, Katery, yeah. was. Tell me about her. She's an awesome, awesome woman. You know, from, uh, from the time I was little, I knew everything would be okay when my mom was there. And she always was just a helpful person, very loving. Anybody who needed help, she was going to be there for them. I read a quote where she said, I worried about all my boys when they left the home, yeah. except for Terrell. I don't know, I, I just, I just, I guess the, one of the things that, that I made sure was that I didn't hurt my mom. And, I'm, and that was, I was very uh, aware of that when I, when I made decisions, that I wanted to make sure that, that uh, I made her feel proud of, of the things that I did. Your dad was a welder in and out of jail. It was not easy all the time being the son of Joe Davis. I mean, he was tough on the boys. Well, I think first of all, he's my dad and I think as um, whether I was seven year old kid or 12, part of that was I knew my dad loved us. And in his own way, he tried his hardest to try to teach us to not be like him. You talk about the fact that he went to jail. My dad was a street guy. He was from St. Louis. And the only thing he knew how to do was to provide for us the best way he knew how. And that was, you know, running a file of the law, whether it was sticking up people, whether it was, you know, selling drugs, whatever he had to do, he did it because he wanted to provide for his family. And he would always say this, he would always say, don't be like me. You know, my life is my life, but I want you guys to be better than me. 
And so being very hard and strict on us inside the home prepared us for outside. You know, my dad at the age, I can remember being eight years old and my dad gave us switchblades and he put like toothpicks in the switchblades and taught us how to, to make sure they was cracked just enough to, so that you can rub it against your leg and it comes open quickly. But that's the environment that we grew up in. Because I think people who don't know San Diego, from the outside, you they, think San Diego, yeah, they it's think palm it's all, trees, yeah, beaches, yeah. and all that. But yeah. you lived in a rough area of San Diego. As, yeah, for San Diego, it was, it was rough. You know, it wouldn't be like going back to St. Louis rough. Hey, come on, man. Yeah, I'm just saying, it's, it's, a, different, it's a different neighborhood, right? Like, you know, East Coast you know, ghettos and, and West Coast ghettos are not the same. So for him, he realized the life that he had gone through, and he, and he was trying to prepare us for life outside, where there was racism, where there was, you know, maybe it wasn't job opportunities, whatever it was, uh, dealing with the cops, all this stuff, he wanted us to be prepared for it. He had this thing about teaching us lessons, and uh, he would always pick the, the, the most inopportune times to do it. It's normally three or four o'clock in the morning when he decides to wake us up. So the four of us, the youngest four, and we, we shared one room and we had two beds in a room. And he made us all sit up in our beds and he pulled out his revolver. And he shot four bullets over each, or one bullet over each of our heads into the wall. And he left the room and we looked at each other and we just went back to bed. Now, I say that because the trust factor that we had with my dad, no one panicked. No one felt that he was going to harm us. He'd always say that, you know, your life is worth only six cents. And apparently that's what a bullet cost back then. And he was trying to show us that you have to make decisions when you leave this house that your, your life could be taken from you like that. The whole time I felt like I was trying to gain his... Uh, his acceptance. And that kind of led me to, I think, playing football and using football as sort of the, the catalyst of it's a tough sport. And maybe if I was good at football, my dad would sort of approve of me. And, uh, and, and not really thinking this out as a kid, but I do remember thinking that, you know, football was a way for me to sort of uh, show my dad that I, that I was tough. There was an underlying um, drive that I didn't realize it then, but looking back on it, I realized that's, that's what it was to prove to him. And that, that became sort of my, the ultimate goal was to play this game, to be as good as I can be at it, but at the same time, to prove to my dad that I'm tough. And, you know, he would come to the games and I would get his, get his approval. He would show up and I can see the, sort of the excitement in his eyes and how he looked at me differently um, than my, than, than, the way he did when I was younger. It explains something though, because I talked to Frank White, your Pop Warner football coach, and time Frank would put a different number jersey on you, <laughs> and you were basically number 30, 31, 32, yeah. 33, so that the other team couldn't find which one was Terrell Davis yeah. after halftime. Is that right? Th that is, that, yeah, that's true. So I played um, Pop Warner until around 12 when my father, uh, my father passed away. And then after that, I just felt like life had no meaning after, after my dad died. Um, it was just, it was empty. Were you there when your father passed away? I was, I was. Um, it was, we were playing softball. And then my mom's friend came up to the softball field her name was Dorothy. She said, hey, get in the car. Um, you guys have to go to the hospital. And the minute we get to the hospital, while we're driving in the car going to the hospital, it's, it's silent. No one's saying anything. You I think, all knew. Yeah, I think we all knew something was, not, something was not right. And I remember it like it was yesterday. And my mom is... She's outside the, outside the door, and I can see on her face, she's crying. And, and when I saw that, I knew. I knew my dad was dead. I knew he had died. And we all just, I mean, it was tough, man. You know, you didn't expect them 
it seemed like it was, it was just, it was sudden. It didn't seem like we had a warning. Yeah, to put it in perspective, your father passed away with lupus at the age of 41. Yeah, that was the hardest, that was the hardest day of my life, man. That was tough. You kind of said this early. Football was a way to prove to your dad yeah. your worth, your toughness, your dedication, whatever word you want to put in there. And once he was gone, yeah. did you no longer have that specific motivation to impress him? Is that why you quit? It just felt like, okay, I no longer have to prove to my dad that I'm tough. And then it just, you know, school wasn't important anymore. Uh, sports wasn't important anymore. Nothing was important when my dad passed away. And uh, I just kind of, I fell into a little hole. Started doing stuff like hanging out with my friends and you know, my mom was working two jobs at the time. So she wasn't around a whole lot. And uh, I just started hanging out with my buddies and going to parties at 12 years old and going to neighborhoods that I shouldn't, have, shouldn't be going to. And this one night we go out and uh, there's a party across town. It's two, I think it's two or three in the morning. I happen to turn my head to the left and I see someone walking towards me. And as I look closer, he's got a double barrel shotgun pointed at my, my face. And he's walking towards me, he's got the gun right here. And, and I'm like, whoa. So I put my hands up and I'm trying to deflect the barrel because it's pretty close, it's almost touching my face. And as I'm backing up, he still has the gun, I'm hitting the barrel and he's rolling the barrel back over. And at this moment, I think that he's about to pull the trigger. But fortunately, one of the guys um, recognized me, but he knew me, he knew my brother, right? And he knew my brother, Bobby. So he says, hey, you know, he says, he's cool. He's, he's cool. He says, um, you know, I know his brother. And so then the guy just puts the shotgun down and he, and he walks off. That night, I, I laid in my bed and I just thought about that. I replayed that, that moment over and over. And I just kept replaying it. I couldn't get it out of my head. And I thought back to what my dad said when he shot those bullets. He says, your life is only worth six cents and it's easy for your life to be taken. And it just made sense to me, like, this is what he's talking about. And you can't continue to put yourself in a position to where you're, you're in harm's way. And uh, that was it. That was a straw. After that day, I, I just mentally said, I'm done. I am going to, uh, I got to change my, I got to change my, my behavior. And, uh, and that's what I did. I ended up changing, changing schools. And then, uh, and, then I, and then I saw Frank. And then Frank said, hey, you need to get back to playing, playing sports. And this was probably a, a week, less than a week after that happened. You transferred to Lincoln High School, which is where Marcus Allen went. Yeah. And did you go in there and dominate at Lincoln right away? No, no. So coming in from another high school, the problem is they've already have a, an established team. And the only spot that I could find was a fullback, and then I ended up playing nose guard. Are you dealing with migraines at this point in your life? Yes. Yeah, I've had migraines since I was nine years old. I still, I still get them. But these are like lose your vision kind of headaches, right? Yeah, they, they're uh, sort of a spectrum disease. Um, you can get very mild migraines, or you can have severe migraines. I had the ones that were like on the scale of one to 10, like an 11. And what happens is that all of a sudden, my vision starts to go. Like, like that. that. You like, don't feel it coming. Don't it's feel just, anything. Wow. I'm, I'm sitting here with you talking. All of a sudden, I can start seeing half of your face. And then I can start seeing, it's like very, it's, it's, it's like if you stare into the sun for a long time, and then you try to focus on something immediately, that's what it looks like. And once the vision starts to come back, that's when the pounding headache comes. And those things can last anywhere from, you know, eight hours to two days. And then it's followed by severe vomiting and uh, nausea and vomiting. And, this, and it, the cycle happens every single time I get a migraine. And I just try to fight through it. And I don't know why I was just, I didn't want to tell anybody what was happening. I just didn't know how to explain it to them. And the I, severity of it. Yeah. Um, when, when, do, when does the world get to see Terrell Davis, the running back? Not, not, in my, not in high school. Not in high school not, at all. Not in high school. So if you're in that position, I'm thinking, there's no way you're thinking NFL. No. No. My goals in high school were pretty simple. Um, to try to get into college. That was it. 
any way I knew how, try to get a scholarship to college. And it wasn't necessarily to go play football, but it was to just have my school paid for. I did get some letters. Some schools showed interest as a fullback, not a nose guard, but as a fullback. And one of the schools that, had, that showed some interest was Long Beach State. Long Beach State, my brother, Reggie, was attending Long Beach State at the time. George Allen, legendary, legendary NFL coach, Hall of Fame coach George Allen, was coming to coach Long Beach that year. It was, it was a great fit because of, of George Allen and what they anticipated the program to, to look like in the next couple of years. And let's be honest, it was the only, basically the only offer I got. Hey, Kai, it's college. It's college. Um, they brought me in and they gave me, a, they gave me a scholarship. It's not easy after that. You know, this, this is another challenge for you because you come in, you redshirt. Yeah. And so you're not playing that first year. I, I didn't play, I played um, scout team. You give, the, you give the first team defense a look is what they call it. You're supposed to give them the best look they can get to, to prepare them for the game. And George Allen, George Allen loved me. And he loved me for a few reasons. I think one, because I didn't ease up on the defense. And that's when they put me at running back. And that's when I got a chance to kind of, kind of get back to what I used okay. to do. That was really the first time in my mind that I even thought about the possibility of playing pro football. And what happens with George Allen? We win our last game of the year, we're six and five. George Allen is doused with the Gatorade bucket. It's in November, it's cold outside. Oh God, don't tell him, yeah. no. And George Allen is 72 years old. He catches pneumonia. Now, and he never recovered. He died, a, he died a month after that. It's like the first guy who really lit the flame for you thinking you could go to the NFL yeah. and this legendary Hall of Fame coach and he passes away. So, and it was, and first of all, it was sad because, you know, I, I established a relationship with him. He was a fantastic sure. man and, um, and a great coach. And then for him to pass away like that was, was, was devastating. We go back to school and uh, I started that year, but I broke my ankle in training camp, my left ankle. I come back, I play five games, I then break my right ankle. So football is just not in the cards for me. I, I right. just, at I, this point, uh, I assume that- Are you ready to chuck it? Like this no, is No, I'm not ready to chuck it. I just don't think I have, it's just the, the events, things that are happening. Bad, terrible yeah, breaks. Terrible things are happening. Well, and then I do that to my ankles. Well, at the end of that year, they call us all in and they tell us that uh, your football program has been canceled. So now- <laughs> So now you not only have, don't have the coach, you've got two broken ankles and there's no football no program football. at Long Beach State. No. I came home one day and in my dorm room, answer machine, there's a recruiter from the University of Georgia that calls and he says his name is Bob Pittert and They've, uh, they're interested in bringing me out uh, you know, on a visit and give them a call back. And it just, I didn't understand how Georgia found out about Long Beach State. It made the national news when the program dropped. So he called one of the coaches and asked him, he said, hey, um, do you guys have any players on your team that can play in the SEC? I mean, this is, a, this is big time college this football. This is big time college football. And the coach said, yes, we have one player. And they said his name is Terrell Davis. And so that, that's, that's why they end up calling, man. <laughs> All right. You get to Georgia and your head coach is Ray Goff. Yeah. He was tough on you, right? Yeah, yeah. Ray at the time, I don't know, I felt like being a California kid and you play for a school like Georgia, um, I didn't think that they really wanted that. And because uh, most of the guys are obviously from Georgia or they're from the Southeast. Is, is it true that at one point he made you leave the sideline? You were, I don't know, you were injured and you had yeah. to buy a ticket and sit up in the upper deck of the stadium? Yeah, yeah, that was. Um, and you're yeah. a player on the yeah. team. I don't understand. I don't, I've never heard of that. Yeah, I didn't either at the time. So I. <laughs> We had a home game, and as a player, I'm, I'm hurt, but I'm still part of the team. 
And I just wanted to, to stand on the sideline with the team. And apparently I couldn't do that. So um, I had to get a ticket, man, to the game. And I ended up sitting up in the highest. I mean, you're talking about I was, I was way up there. So what were you thinking when you were up there watching the game from the stands? Well, part of it was I just kind of, I just kind of, I thought about my career and I thought about where I was and, and I started asking myself some questions about my career, you know, questions like, did I play hard enough? Did I study hard enough? Um, did I work out hard enough? Did I give the game everything I, that I had? And the answer that it came back was, was no, it was no, you didn't. And so I decided that if I ever came back and if I was able to play, then I'm going to, I've got to take it to a different level. I've got to go back to being who I am as a person. Because I don't feel like I was me when I was at Georgia. I feel like I was trying to play like somebody else. I wasn't having fun like I did when I was a kid in Pop Warner. Um, I was playing safe, you know, and safe means as a running back, if the play is designed to go left, you're going to take it left. And if there's nothing there, that's it, and end of the play. And then when I came back, they put me back on scout team. And uh, they actually put, they put me at fullback when I, when I returned. So, here, I, so here I'm at fullback again. I'm blocking for Heinz Ward, but I'm also playing scout team again. And um, as I'm doing that, as I'm playing scout team, I'm just being me again. And so if their play's meant to go right, I'll take a sweep right, I'll stop, reverse field. And this is against our defense in practice. And the, the defense hated it because they, they couldn't stop it. And every time you can't stop a play, you know how it is, you got to redo it. Um, I didn't care. I, I was playing football and I was excited to play football again. And I only had four more games to play when I, came, when I returned. So to me, it was about finishing my college career on a high note. So here's video of Terrell's last game at Georgia getting an opportunity to show what he can do. 35, pushing up to the 40-yard line, Terrell Davis. Fire again, finds Davis on the flats. The turn inside the 10, down to about the 8-yard line. Bobo back, Bobo looking back to him again. He's fighting Romo in the second half. Davis again over the 40, up to midfield. Bobo, the deep handoff. Davis, touchdown, Georgia. Campbell, he made a cut there, and it is hard to do. Total domination. I like that. <laughs> I haven't seen that one, man. You haven't seen that? No, and back then you could take the helmets off, so that, that was not a I was going to say, flag. No flag, no flags. You could take the helmet off back then. And I saw, you see the tape, I saw, you see the attitude a little bit on that tape, a little bit. That's what I saw. I saw, I saw a little attitude on that tape. Like, finally. In a, in a good way, though, in a, in a good way. But, yeah. like, like, finally. Like a free, a free, the guy who's playing loose, a guy who's playing just with a little diff, different energy level. And I was just proud of that. You know, I was, I was proud that if my career had ended, that I can walk away and say that I've, I left everything on, on the field and I was, I was happy and proud the way I finished my career. And, and that's all I was shooting for. That was it. But that wasn't it. You end up getting drafted by the Broncos yeah. at the back end of the draft, sixth round pick. So do you go there thinking these guys really want me? I've got the inside <laughs> track. I'm going to be in the NFL. Not, Joe. And I remember telling my mom this. And I said, Mom, I was like, I was like, yeah, you know what I mean, that's cool. I, I got drafted. I'm, 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 I'm. She, she's like, well, you're not excited? I was like, not really. She was like, why? I said, well, I'll be excited when it comes the first game of the season and I'm the starting tailback. Then I'll be excited. And she thought I was being ungrateful. I'm like, no, I'm just, I'm just, I said, six round pick. They just, they, they just going to use me as camp bait. I'm just going to camp for, so for them to beat me up. To get hit. To get hit. That's it. They're not drafting me in the sixth round uh, thinking that, that I'm going to be a part of the team. And that was my mentality when I got drafted. And I'm not quite getting the approval of my running backs coach, Bobby Turner. And he is constantly on me. When you guys go for a preseason game in Japan against the 49ers, you're having big doubts. Yeah. After practice, I feel like this. They're going to cut me anyway. They're going to cut me. I'm not making this team. There's no need for me to stick around to go through this stuff, this punishment again. So I want to leave. I go to the hotel. I call down to the front desk, and I ask to – I remember this is before, like, Travelocity or Expedia or anything like that. Right. The communication wasn't, wasn't quite uh, connecting. Right. <laughs> it wasn't quite connecting. So I just 
after it was compli- it was very complicated getting out of there, I just said, okay, all right, I'll just deal with this. When we go back, then I'll quit. First quarter comes, second quarter comes, no one, um, this is, it doesn't look like I'm a play. But the veterans are out the game now. Well, they're on the sideline and they're, they're, everyone's eating. They're eating hot dogs and nachos and, you know, the vets, the vets are having a good time over there. And I'm starving. I don't eat before games. I decided to join the veterans, man. So I'm throwing out the hot dogs and the Doritos, whatever we're eating over there. And uh, then the coach comes over and says, hey, Davis, you're in on kickoff coverage. So he's got a belly full of hot dogs, <laughs> maybe some Doritos. He wanted to quit. He's on kickoff coverage, and this happens. It's impressive. A reporter asked him if he knew everybody, everybody's name on the team, and he said no. And if he, I don't know him, they won't be here. He impressed Drakeford, I'll tell you that. Boy, oh boy. What they didn't show was I, I went back to the bench and threw up. They didn't show that right. part, though. Yeah. But, but what was interesting, uh, Mike Patrick and Joe Theismann were doing the game, and they said, we asked Mike Shanahan about some of these young guys, and do you know their names? And he said, I don't know a lot of their names, but they're going to have to impress me to make the team. Yeah. Then basically I'll know their names, and they'll come with us to start the season. And, and he said, after the fact, you made that play, and that basically made the Denver Broncos team for you. Yeah. You've got to be prepared. You've got to be ready. And I wasn't prepared, to be honest with you, but the opportunity presented itself. And I remember thinking when they called me in, I was like, I've got to make a play. I've got to make a play. And even though I didn't, I didn't want to be in there, um, I did see it as a chance to, to, make, to make an impact. Every game from that point on, I'm on every single special teams. I'm actually number one on everything. I'm the kickoff returner. I'm running out on kicks. I'm the punt protector. I run out on punts. I'm on everything. And then after that, um, they gave me some runs. They put me in as, as a running back and gave me a few carries. And, did you uh, do all right? I, I, did, I did. Yeah, I did well. You know, that year you became the lowest pick to rush for 1,000 yards. You know that? I know that. The lowest yeah. pick. 196th pick in the NFL draft, running backs going off the board. And there's Terrell Davis, who makes the team because of a special team's kick cover play. Yeah. You rush for 1,000 yards your rookie year, which was a statement yeah. by you. I mean, that, that had to feel like, my God. I mean, considering your career at that point, your biggest highlights were in Pop Warner before that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I just reminded myself of that day when I was sitting in the stands in Georgia. I just looked back and just reminded myself that I could either be sitting up on the in the stands watching someone play, or that could be me on the field playing. In your second season, uh, you end up having another phenomenal year, 1,500 yards, uh, and you end up in the playoffs down in Miami against the Jacksonville Jaguars. We were favorite. <clears throat> we were in 1996, we had won 13, and three, we had 13 games, and we had essentially clinched the uh, first round by like the early part of December. And uh, we, we had to throttle back because we didn't want to continue to play hard and get people hurt. So we kind of, we were just out there playing, which, which hurt us a little bit. That's hard to do, right? It's to, hard to, to do. To take your foot off the gas and try to pace yourself for, to peak when it counts the most. Yeah. We, we figured we can just flip a switch when we play Jacksonville. And we played them in, a, in our it was a divisional round, I believe. And um, they came to Mal High Stadium and they beat us. Yeah, that was a game where you were in tears. Yes. After that game. Yeah. Had you ever reacted to a loss like that in your life? Never. Never, because I, I knew then we had a special team, and I just couldn't believe it. Like, I, I just... It was, it was shocking. It was shocking. Uh, you see them celebrating on our field, and you look around like, what just happened? But I also think that that loss sort of propelled us. I think that loss was necessary for us to feel that pain, to feel how it, it, uh, it felt to, to, to be embarrassed and to be disappointed like that. And we carry that from that point on. How important is a championship now to you personally to get it done, to have a ring, to, to put your name on that wall, so to speak? That was it. That was the only motivating factor. That was, that was it.
I didn't think about stats. I didn't think about Pro Bowls. I didn't think about uh, new contracts. The only thing that I really, and, and, and I'm not just saying this, I think it's not just lip service. I really felt that that was the only thing that I wanted. We have this quote on the wall. You can be the best person in the league, but if you don't win championships, something's missing. Yeah. And, and I, I feel like that, that, is, that became you. If you think about football, I, I, we've all watched the Super Bowls, and you see the teams hoisting that thing, and you see the Niners for so many years, the Cowboys, the Steelers, and what's etched in my brain and, and what has always has, has been there was when I think about the NFL, I think about Super Bowls. I don't think about anything else. You know, that's it. I think about winning that trophy. And so when I got there and I, and I realized that, man, I'm in a pretty good situation. we got a pretty good team. This thing is not far-fetched. This is it's within reach. Let's go get it. 1997, you have over 1,700 yards, 15 touchdowns, and now you're here. You're knocking on the door again, and guess who comes calling the Jacksonville Jaguars yeah. again? And that already put a smile on your face. You got a... You got a chance for a little payback there. Yes, we did. That was lovely. <laughs> it was lovely. We were hoping to play them too. We were hoping, we were praying to play the Jacksonville Jaguars. But yeah, that year, that year became an interesting uh, playoff mantra. And um, it's kind of the, we kind of the revenge tour is how we kind of we named it. We played Jacksonville round one. Kansas City, we end up beating them. Um, then we had to go play Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh. Again, we ended up winning that game. And we felt like once we came out of that, we were hardened. You know, we can go anywhere and play, and we can play any team, and we felt good about our chances. And so, we, of course, we had to play the Packers. Um, a favored Packers team. Yeah, good, a very good team. Super Bowl 32. Here's the cool part. In San Diego. Yeah, my hometown. In your hometown. <laughs> yep. So you get a chance to go home and play a Super Bowl. I mean, that's storybook. Yeah. That is, and, and it, it, it is, but it's going to be challenging because there's distractions. Every day, people want your attention. People want something from you, and you're on television, interviews. Um, it's, it's a lot of people grabbing at you. And at it, some point, you go, hey, we got to play a game. Yeah, sometimes you lose sight of that. You lose sight early in the week. A lot of people have fallen you, into that trap. <laughs> you lose sight. And then you, you have to refocus. So the one thing I, I was conscious of, too, was trying to, figure, trying to make sure this. I don't treat this game any differently than any game I played in. And here's why. I felt every game I played in, I played the best I can play. I've, I've never walked into a game and said, you know what? Hey, I've only, I'm only going to play 75%. I, I felt I've, I've given every game my all. So why should this game be any differently? You're in San Diego. You're in the Super Bowl. The championship is what's missing and the only thing you want. And in the first quarter. First quarter. <laughs> migraine comes Here's, calling. Yep, here he comes. Mr. Migraine. And, yep. Just under two minutes remaining in the opening quarter. Second and short. Davis. I think Davis may be shaking. Take him out. Take, take Davis out. Don't worry about it. you can't see on this play. We're going to use you as a decoy. Yeah. Just go back out there, yeah, yeah. and if you're not out there, they won't believe that we're actually going to run the ball to the back. That yeah. is that. I mean, that's <laughs> life in the NFL. I can't see. Yeah. Don't worry about that. Don't worry that. about seeing. You don't need to see on this play. You don't need to see. Just run the play. He said it, and without hesitation, I walked on the field. As long as you know I can't see, don't give me the ball, please. Just don't give me the ball. I don't want to cause this team. I mean, is that just natural reaction? You knowing kind of where to go? I mean, it's not black, but you, no. it's just fuzzy, right? Right. Like, it's just, it's just not clear. Like In your mind, are you thinking, my Super Bowl's over? Yeah, I was, it was the worst time. I felt, I, was, I felt bad because I felt like I was, I was letting people down. I was going to let my teammates down. I was going to let the Bronco fans down. I was praying to God that I was just saying, this is the wrong time for this to happen. I just could, I mean, I was in shock that it was happening at, at this point. Now, you have admitted since that you forgot to take your migraine medicine before yeah, the game? Yeah, I did. In, in all the hoopla of the Super Bowl, you yeah. forgot that part. So when, when you're in the locker room, you can hear the reaction in the stadium, and now Green Bay's coming back. 
and you're in there, I assume, in darkness? Yeah, I'm in a, I'm in a, in a room back there, and they turn the light off, and they just, uh, it's, it's quiet. So um, I, I was just going to, I don't care what, what was going to happen in that game. Nothing was going to take me out for the, for the whole game. I was going to play in that game because I felt like, listen, I, I can feel fine tomorrow. You know, today I have to play through this and just play through as much as I can and try to help us win this championship because this is not guaranteed anymore. This is not guaranteed to be here next year or the year after that. So just like what I talked about before with Jacksonville, we've got to take advantage of this. And I felt I had to play in, in order for us to, to, try to, to try to win that game. Terrell Davis said he felt much better. He's going to try and play in the second half and feels he can be effective. Super Bowl championship for the Denver Broncos. That was a great day. <laughs> what did that feel like? It was awesome. You know, it was awesome. It I was mean, awesome. you rode the roller coaster that day. Yes, yes. What do you think your dad would have said to you with oh, that, yeah. that exhibition of tough? I think he would have been happy. Yeah, he would have been, he would have been proud. He would have been proud. Uh, the next season, you had an opportunity to join a really exclusive club, 2,000 rushing yards in a season. Only three had done it, uh, guys that are on the Mount Rushmore of, of running backs in the NFL. Um, and you're coming down the stretch, and you need, what, 200 yards the last two weeks to get this done? Yeah, about 200 yards, yeah. And in your 15th game, you only have, what, 29 yards? Yeah, yeah. So that meant you needed 170 in your final game to get to the 2,000-yard mark. Right. I don't think it's possible. They tell me you're going to play, you're going to play at least the first half, and then we'll see, see how it goes from there. Playing the first quarter, things are going fairly well. Second quarter, all right, you had 54 yards. Okay, you're at 70 yards. So halftime, I think I was I was halfway there. I'm not sure about that, but I, well, we have video. Oh, you have video. Okay, yeah. let's let's show the video then. And off goes to Davis. Good block by Jones. Davis gets another block from Smith. That offensive line is doing everything they can to give him their good running start. Good shot. Davis has just passed Earl Campbell for the fourth best year ever by a running back. He only needs 23 more yards. He's playing with bad ribs and a bad back. Davis breaks a tackle. He's got He's got 2,000. You notice he said, I, I was playing with bad ribs and a bad back. Right. <laughs> yeah. Is that right? Was that accurate? That was accurate. That was accurate. So that's a big part of this. I mean, you're nicked up, you're injured, whatever you want to say, and you've got the playoffs, which is what everybody really yeah. cares about coming. But I, I just love that the team loved you that much to make sure that you got there. Yeah, and that's what it's about. It was, it was more about, like you said, it was, it was our goal. It wasn't my goal. It was our goal. And anytime you have a good running game, it's typically more than just a back doing it in the line. It's everybody else who, who's involved in that. You join... O.J., yeah, Eric Dickerson, Dickerson and, and Barry, Barry at Sanders. The time. Yeah, that's that was, that was sweet class, man. <laughs> wow. Yeah. How far you have come. I know. I know. <laughs> it's so hard to validate, so to speak, a Super Bowl win. Yeah. I mean, it just doesn't seem to happen anymore. Teams repeating, and and there you are going into it for the second time, second year in a row. You're taking on the Atlanta Falcons. You're going, now you're going for back-to-back -back championships. Anything different with you? Anything different with the team as far as how you prepare for the Super Bowl now that you've done it once? Yeah, not really. I, I, the only thing that changed for us was probably expectations. Um, now yeah, you're the favorite. Now we're the favorite. And, and that role, I don't like that role. That role is a little, there's too much pressure being the favorite. All you can do is kind of fail to live up to expectations. Exactly. I mean, if we win, you're expected to win. If you lose, then it's the biggest upset in Super Bowl history. So you don't like that. But, again, I just try to keep it simple, man. Like, I've played this game before. It's, it's a big game, but it's, it, it really is just a game. If you, if you bring it every week, there's no need to have to ratchet things up when the game is big. Super Bowl 33. 
Pitch back to Davis. Cuts back. And Terrell Davis crosses into Atlanta territory. All the way Davis. And Davis hurdles over the Falcon 15 yards. And Davis again breaks away from one, breaks away from two, gets inside the 10 to the 8. Davis breaks from the tackle behind the line of scrimmage and almost broke it all the way. Terrell Davis wound up with 102 yards and... When you have an individual who gets over 100 yards rushing in the Super Bowl game, no team has ever lost. Do you? Pretty good, man. Do you? Do you look at those highlights now as a almost 45 year old man and go, "Damn, this is the first time I'm seeing these highlights, man." Do you look at them as, yeah, as now like, an I'm observer? Like, I'm like, like, damn, he was pretty damn good. <laughs> that boy, that boy was pretty bad, brother. <laughs> I do. You should. I gotta get a highlight reel to show my kids. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't think they believe their dad was was, was good. That would be on a there. loop in my house. <laughs> if that was me, yeah. you know, like, oh, dad's playing his highlights again. You don't. You don't go home and watch that stuff ever. I, I don't even know where to find it. I have no idea where to we'll find it. We'll give you the tapes. Yeah, please do. Um, did you know that was gonna be John Elway's last game? We hoped it wouldn't, but there was. T- yeah, there was. There was talk about it. And we tried to convince him to come back. At least try to, do, let's see if we can get three. If we can get three in a row, then you can retire. But physically, that an entire year, it was tough on him. He would miss a lot of practice time. He would constantly be in the training room, getting treatment. And you can just tell that it was, it was, it, it was wearing on him. Like, he, you, you can only fight it so long uh, from a physical standpoint. You know, mentally, you can still be strong, but physically, uh, you can tell that it was starting to uh, starting to really affect his play a little bit and where he wanted to be, I think, physically. So it's not long after that. Now John's gone. You know, the chances for a three-peat kind of go out of the window early. Uh, the next season, 1999, fourth game of the year. If you haven't watched highlights of you doing that in a Super Bowl, I'm going to bet you haven't watched the highlight of your, in essence, last real play in the NFL. Oh. The tackle? But the tackle. <laughs> so, Brian Greasy throws an interception. Mm-hmm. And what I, why I want to play the highlight is, because this is what everybody always said about you, your toughness, you're a competitor, there are running backs, quarterbacks, that once a pick happens and somebody's yeah. running it back, they basically take a knee or fake a tackle. But you're trying to get in to make a tackle. I just know how to play the game one way. That's it. I don't have, I don't have different versions of how I play football. It's one way. That was it. Here it is. Yeah. On the field, Greasy from the shotgun. Over the middle, and this one is intercepted. Well, what That's Matt Lepsis. Did he get his knee? I didn't see what happened. But watch what happens. Let's see if he walks. Boys walking. Wow. Now, yeah. I, I think that, that to me is in some ways every bit as impressive as the runs we saw in the Super Bowl. You know what I mean? That yeah. You're in there sticking your nose in there because you're a team player. Yeah, it's, and it's kind of ironic that my career started with the tackle, right? And the irony is it kind of ended trying to make a tackle. You know, I, I've been blessed, and if that was the last play for me, then I was, I was great. With, I was fine with that because my career should have never happened anyway. So I was playing sort of with, like with house money, in my opinion. You know what I mean? So yeah. I, I'm playing with house money, man. Like I made it to the NFL, well, won championships. I've experienced so much uh, that the game has offered and given me that um, I only know how to play the game one way. And if that play happens again and I can do it again, I'm going to make the same play. I'm not going to do anything differently. And it, it kind of went in fits and starts yeah. after that. Less than 20 games played yeah. the rest of your unbelievable NFL career. But that's, that can't be the last piece of tape we show. I hope not. The last piece of tape we show, you, you wanted to – retire in uniform, which is cool, and to do it at home in 2002 in front of your fans yeah. in Denver. 
and give them one final salute, yeah. which looked like this. Can you? Thank you. Can you explain to people, including me, who have never had something like that, can you explain what that feels like when an entire stadium is on its feet yeah. cheering for you? It's humbling, and at the same time, it's, uh, I don't know, man. It's, it's just, it's incredible to have that feeling, to have people who support you like that, and to know that not only in the stadium, but people at home who are watching, and to know that you, you've been a part of their lives, that's a, that's a great feeling. You got the Mile High Salute one last time. I never asked you, where, where did that start? Who's, whose idea, how'd you come about this is what we're gonna do, what I'm gonna do. Yeah. It was just sort of, we had, it was the year we lost to Jacksonville and we were in training camp and I'm like, you know what? We have to have a, a mentality around here that's, that's different. And I, so I looked around, I'm like, who has like the, the, who's the toughest SOBs out there? Like what, like, what, like what profession? And it came back to being a soldier, man, a serviceman or woman. And you think that uh, what they go through for us in this country, that to honor them, I felt like I wanted to embody that, that attitude. And then uh, so I was like, listen, every time you know, we score a touchdown, I'm going to salute. I'm going to salute the teammates, the fans, and everybody who's watching. And that became, that became our calling card there. And, uh, That's great. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So when you, when you retired in 2002, did you think Hall of Fame was possible? I did not. It's weird when you, because when you think of Hall of Fame, in my mind, I'm watching guys like, you know, that's like Joe Namath. You think about it like, you know, Dan Marino and then Walter Payton. And, and Terrell Davis. And Terrell, and now, <laughs> but now, that, now, but that just didn't, you know, and that, but, but that, that common, that's common among players. When you talk to, even like LT and Kurt Warner, you talk to them, they've never, I don't think they saw themselves as, Hall of Famers. I could ask you what it means to you, but I wonder as you sit here now in 2017, uh, what you think it would mean to your dad who could say, my boy's a Hall of Famer. Yeah. The world. I, I think my dad would be extremely proud, man. I, I really, I really, I know he would. Deep down inside, he was a caring father. And that, and that came through in the way he protected us. Um, again, his methods were a little unique, but I mean, he'd be on cloud nine to know that his son was getting, you know, enshrined into the, the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I don't think he would have ever thought about that. Yeah. We have a final question coming up, but I want to do one thing. We had a picture flash by that I don't think you caught okay. earlier in, in the program. And it was your dad with your brothers around, you on your dad's lap, a Colt bottle of Colt yeah, 45. <laughs> I mean, right That's there, it. man. That's it. That little dude's a Hall of Famer. That little dude right there. There's no way, no way he, he, saw, he saw this moment coming. No way. <laughs> That's, That's awesome. That's great, though. That's awesome. I miss him, man. I do. What's next for you? Uh, well, I'm a dad and myself, so I have a, a six, a four, and a two-year-old. So, uh, yeah, yeah. You better, better hope that knee's gonna hold up. Uh, who you telling, man? Who you telling? Hope my pockets hold up, man. These yeah. kids are expensive. <laughs> but no, I, I mean, as far as, I guess for me, it's just family, man. I, I just, I'm trying to be the best father and, and husband I can be as, as possible. And that's really where my focus is, man. The, the business stuff, that's, that comes and goes, but ultimately where I wanna, I, I wanna focus my attention to is my family. All right, here's how we end. Fun questions. Would you rather be able to change the past or see the future? Ooh. Change, uh, see the future. Yeah. See what's coming your way? Yeah. Some big linebacker ready to take your head <laughs> off? Would you rather fight a giant hamster or a small rhinoceros? <laughs> how small? Like, like a, uh, like, a chihuahua, like a like, chihuahua size? Yeah, I'm going to say a little bigger, like knee-high rhinoceros. How big is a hamster? Like uh, a size of an elephant or a horse? Yeah, I like an elephant-sized hamster. Give me, the, the, give me the rhino. You can kick him around a little give bit? Give me the rhino. 
<laughs> and last question, what makes a great running back? What makes a great running back? Vision, you have to have good vision. Uh, instincts, you got, and you gotta have some talent. You gotta have some talent. Well, this is a man who had a boatload of talent, almost walked away from the game before he got a chance to shine. And if he said he was playing with house money at the end of his career, he turned house money into a Hall of Fame career. Two-time Super Bowl champion, wonderful guy, Terrell Davis. Oh, thank you, brother.